Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Championship Showcase, Secrets for Success, from the playing field of competition to the field of life. We're speaking with inspirational sports leaders, former athletes, coaches, administrators, and related professionals who are sharing their life strategies and empowering messages of hope and purpose to support those athletes that are seeking to make a successful transition. My name is Dominic Militello, and we're so glad you could join us today. We have a fantastic show for you, so let's jump right in. Today we're speaking with a very energetic and intelligent Ed Butowski. Ed is an internationally recognized expert in the wealth management industry. He has been in the financial services for more than 25 years and started his career with Morgan Stanley, where he was a senior vice president in private wealth management. During his 18-year career there, he became the firm's top producer nationally, as well as the first advisor to surpass $1 billion in assets under management. And that's right, that's B as in boy, folks. He was also recognized as a member of both the Chairman's Club and the Equity Club, a distinction reserved for only the top advisors at Morgan Stanley. Through his work with professional athletes, Ed was prominently featured in the 2009 Sports Illustrated article, How and Why Athletes Go Broke, which became one of the most widely read sports articles in Sports Illustrated history. Additionally, Ed was featured in the film Broke, an ESPN 30 for 30 documentary chronicling professional athletes and their monetary experiences based in part from the Sports Illustrated article. Ed is a frequent guest speaking about financial worldwide current events on CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNBC, Fox Business News, Bloomberg TV, and China TV, and has made hundreds of appearances on national television. Ed launched Chapwood Investments, LLC, in 2005, a private wealth management advisory firm focusing on providing comprehensive financial counseling and investment advice to wealthy families and individuals. Ed is a longstanding member of the Dallas community where he resides with his family, and he is an avid tennis player and golfer. We're very fortunate and thrilled to have Ed Butowski with us. Ed, welcome to the showcase. Well, thank you very much, and, and thanks for the uh, nice introduction. Well, we know you're very busy, very, very busy, and we really appreciate you spending time with us. And we know from your bio you're very smart when it comes to money management. More importantly, how is your golf game? <laughs> it's funny because I was just about to say I haven't played in about a year because of a bad back. But before before that, I was okay. I was a seven handicap. <laughs> but uh, I don't think I'll see a seven again uh, ever in my lifetime. Well, listen, get back, get back, get that back feeling better and get back on the links. Uh, for those who may not be as aware with your upbringing and background, will you share a little bit about your story with us? Sure. Uh, I grew up in a, in a very nice community. I grew up in Westchester County, which is just outside of New York City, uh, in a town called Chappaqua, which today people remember or know well because uh, the Clintons lived there, and they uh, have lived there many years after I moved out of Chappaqua. Uh, my father was a corporate securities attorney, but he started his career as the head of enforcement at the Securities and Exchange Commission. So he's an attorney who worked his way up and made a living out of putting bad people in jail uh, and going after bad people. Um, we uh, moved to New York after he was done with that stint in Washington and went into private practice. And for anybody who knows what a mutual fund is, he actually authored the amendment to the rules in 1975. It was called the Investment Company Act of 19. 19- 40, he amended that, uh, and it was approved by, uh, I guess, the powers that be, whoever approved those things back then. And um, my mother and father, you know, sadly, have both passed away, but they instilled in us a very, very much a, an empathetic attitude towards people. And I think that's what's helped me quite a bit with uh, professional athletes, because I really feel for people who, you know, we maybe have had some great successes, but then these failures, I, I, I feel as though there's a tr- real easy way to fix a lot of these problems. And I think I get this really from, from my parents uh, wanting to help people out, and not everything I do has a dollar sign attached to it. So there's a lot of volunteer work that I do. Nice. Well, thank you very much. I know you're very visible in the general public. Would you ever consider running for public office? No, I, I, I wouldn't have, although I do support some campaigns and I, I'm back in the messaging, but um, they don't even make a lot of money, by the way. I started <laughs> noticing that. I mean, these guys, these men and women, I don't know why they do this because they, they, I, I really don't understand. I mean, if you do it for a couple, you know, a couple of terms, you know, maybe you do that as a stepping stone someplace. And right. I'm not saying money is everything, but it sure is nice to have. Yeah, exactly. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. 
and we're going to talk more about that. I'm really curious, though. Tell us um, how you got selected for the Sports Illustrated article, maybe even for the 30, the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a really interesting story. So I actually didn't get selected. I'm the one who actually made that article happen. Uh, I was sitting around one day with my friend Winford Tubbs, uh, a neighbor of mine who played professional football, and he said, "Will you take a look at this one investment I have?" And I said, "Sure." So he showed it to me, and it was a I had no problem with the investment. And he said, um, "He said, you know, I'm really happy you said that because we all have it." And I said, what do you mean we all have it? He said, almost everybody in the NFL has this investment. And I thought, after more investigation and talking with Winford, I realized that there were so many people doing the same thing and repeating what everybody else was you know, doing, regardless of their own circumstances. Because even though everybody might be you know, playing football in the NFL, that doesn't mean everybody's you know, goals and dreams and circumstances are the same. So what I did is I called up Sports Illustrated because it finally hit me why these athletes are going broke. And I called up Richard Zemat, who was the managing editor at the time. I think he still is. And I said on his voicemail that there's an article we need to do, and I'll help craft the article. And once that article, you know, that, that article will be tremendous, so please give me a call. I didn't hear back from him. So then I called again about six months later, didn't hear back from him. And it really drives me crazy when people don't call me back. So the third time I called, I said, please give me a call back. This article will increase circulation 4.2% that month. And he said, he calls me, and he says, the only reason I'm calling you is to correct you that Sports Illustrated comes out weekly, not monthly. (laughs) And I said, okay, fine. And I said, do me a favor. Will, Will you consider the article? He said, you know what I'll do? I'll assign a young guy to it named Pablo Torre, who we just hired. He just came out of Harvard. Now, most people know Pablo very well now. He's a great young guy, a reporter. He's now over at ESPN. Uh, But this was Pablo's, one of his first or second articles he ever wrote. And I outlined it. I almost everything in there is from me. I just don't know how to type and write, but Pablo and I worked very hard on that article and it and I'm proud to say it became the number one article in the history of Sports Illustrated. Wonderful story. And one day I don't think anybody has any idea that you were you were the driver behind that because it certainly doesn't you don't it's not portrayed that way in any way, shape or form. What was yeah, well, what was pa- the most pa- sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say Pablo, you know, had to hide that, that fact a little bit. Uh, but if anyone reads it, it was uh, March of 2009, they'll see that almost all the storylines there are, well, every, all of them, not most of them, all of them are from me and my experiences with different clients. But I'm also proud to say that we put one of some guy in jail. His name is Kirk Barton from uh, uh, Triton Financial. He was he had been stealing 200, from 289 people, he had been using professional athletes as a front to gather assets. And he had been stealing the money, and he, he went to jail for 19 years. Wow, interesting. Very. What I was going to ask you, my next question was going to be, what surprised you the most from doing your research for the article in the documentary? Well, the, the purpose of the article, and, and, and the movie broke, we really did as a way to take what we did in Sports Illustrated and bring it to life. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but... My overriding goal here is that I remember Mayor Giuliani many years ago wrote a book, and one of the chapters was you have to defang problems. You've got to talk about them. You can't just dance around them. You've got to hit them you know, straight on. And I thought, you know what, we really have to do that. We have to go in and explain problems, use some anecdotes, you know, anecdotal stories to explain exactly what took place, but then show people how to fix this, and that's what we've done in, in both of these. What surprised me the most uh, is really how wonderful athletes are and how much they want to help others and how, and how fearful they are of something that they're not knowledgeable about. Uh, I, the thing that turned me was how many people in my industry like to just put people down and not teach them and not help them understand things because it makes them look better because they have this knowledge and the others don't have it. And that's what really bothered me. So uh, too many people in our society today, Dominic, are, are, are literally um, bullying people 
because of knowledge. And there's nothing that I do or anybody else in my profession that we do that's that difficult. We just have to take the time to craft a message and explain things in a way that people understand. And if we can't do that, it's not the message, it's not the person we're trying to talk to and they're in them receiving that message properly. It's our fault. Our job is to craft a message that's easy to understand. And if we can't do that, that's our problem. We shouldn't laugh at other people that don't get it. Well, Ed, it sounds like um, you have a philosophy that's worked for you. Is that the same kind of philosophy you had coming up through the ranks in the financial industry? Um, well, to, to a degree. I mean, in, in my industry, I, I grew up, uh, I didn't do great in, in, in high school for sure. College, I did okay. But I always remember speaking to my father who was, you know, in the industry as I had talked about. And I told him, I said, I'd like to be a financial advisor. And the best motivating thing he ever did, he, he looked at me and said, you can give it a shot, son, but you're not going to be any good. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what kind of message was that? <laughs> I was like, whoa, I'll remember that one when I have kids. And um, so that really was my driving force. But money has never been, the amount of money I make has never been my driving force. What has always been the thing that has motivated me is competition. I love beating other people. Um, I love uh, finding ways to uh, explain things and win business and manage money for people. And that's what I enjoy doing the most. And that has been really the motivating factor behind uh, my, my, you know, what success I've had in the industry. And that success drive also has been the thing that has prompted me or really excelled me to learn more. Uh, when you go to these big firms, they don't necessarily teach you everything you need to know. You have to do a lot of learning on your own as well. And uh, my drive to succeed and my drive to beat the pants off my competition has excelled my, my desire to learn more. I mean, it's interesting that the, the guest speakers we've had on the show so far, competition seems to be a theme throughout our discussion, whether it's on the field or off the field. Um, in athletics or in business, and it sounds to me like you have really had that that value to to compete and get out there and and, and be successful. Who were some of your mentors? You mentioned your father a couple times. Um, who else? Who else were were some of your mentors that you learned from and and um, have used their strategies? You know, during your career, yeah. throughout your career. Well, the the power. I've I've got into a point in my life where I just started reading all these motivational books. And that, my, that was really something that helped me quite a bit. The Norman Vincent Peels, the Zig Ziglar, who ironically um, lived uh, in, you know, before his passing, lived in our hometown. I'd have lunch with Zig Ziglar about once a month, and, um, and I loved it. Um, there's also a, a book uh, called Man's Search for Meaning, written by a guy named Victor Frankel, and the takeaway from that book is that the only thing we have complete control over is our attitudes and our thoughts. So when I combined all of that along with, you know, the greatest of all time, uh, you know, without any question, uh, you know, the, when, when you start looking at all of this body of work that, you know, is out there of motivational speakers and positive thinking, I realized that I just need to brainwash myself every single day to, um, only see positive things. Uh, I know there's negative things around. I, I look at my life that I'm standing on a fairway or a tee box, and I know there's sand traps, and I know there's lakes out there and trees, but I don't want to see them. I don't want to talk about them. I don't want to look at them, all right, because somehow you magically end up going to them, and I want to avoid that, and that has been a, a driving force for me because I'm the most annoying positive person in the world, I think if, if you're going to put something on my tombstone, uh, it would be that I was an irrational optimist. All right. Well, you know, I've heard the saying that what you think about, you bring about. And you're saying fill your life with positive things and don't think about anything negative, And that's what, you're, that's what will show up for you is what it sounds like. It, it, it is amazing how that happens. And, and I'll tell you, anybody, you know, who really wants to be successful at anything, you know, you, there's, there's obviously there's things that can go wrong. And it's amazing that if you think about it, you will become it. You know, you are what you think about. And, um, and you know, there's many people who have written many books and there's great speeches, but it really does work because I'm not the smartest guy in the world. But I'll tell you right now, you're not going to meet a more positive person. Well, it sounds like, and we, we get that sense from you hearing your voice, 
You know, Ed, one thing that really stuck out or struck out for me in, in, the, in the documentary broke was the situation with Bernie Kosar. Um, what would you say to an athlete that feels obligated to their family for their success and wants to use them as their financial manager? Yeah, well, it happens all the time. Um, and, and I deal with, you know, hundreds of athletes and there, there seems to be, which also should shed light into the spirit and the soul of some of these young men, uh, that they really do want to take care of their families. They really, they realize the, uh, the sacrifices their parents had made, taking them to games and spending money and giving up weekends and so on, and they really feel that need. Uh, there's probably no one in the world that I see that more than, uh, you know, Matt Kemp, for instance. Uh, I've never seen anybody love his mother more than that young man does. And when I look at Bernie Kosar, your heart breaks when you find out what his dad was doing behind the scenes there. Um, there's just no other way of putting it. What I do for my clients is I put a family plan together. We put them on a budget. We explain to them how money works. There's a ball player who was drafted last year into the NBA, and, and I asked his mother. She, she was getting on the plane, ironically, right after the draft, and she was kind of dancing, and she said, I'm going to get me some money. I'm going to get me some money. And I said, what do you mean? And I didn't know who this was. I saw her son get on afterwards, and I realized it because he had had a, a hat from a certain team. And I walked up to her and I said, what do you mean you're going to get me some money? She said, and I said, well, let's spend a little time together. So I encouraged her and her husband to come up to my office because we lived in Dallas. And I said, your son's going to make this much. So basically, the amount of money that you think you're going to make from your son each month is going to be about 75% of what he is going to make. And she said, yes, that's right. Yep. And I said, so you're going to take 75% of your son's money. And she said, yep. And I just looked at her and she went, I can't do that, can I? I go, no. And she just said, I can't do that. I go, no, you're not going to. And so we put her on a little bit of a budget. So instead of her getting $12,000 a month, she's getting 3500 Now, wow. that's her son's decision. And, you know, he's 18, 19 years old. He's going to do whatever his parents want. Right, right. Are you? Is that what you're seeing, Ed? Is is with the with the athletes that do struggle? Um, they just do not know how to manage money. They do not know how to budget, and that's where they get in, into trouble. Well, that. But the, look, there's a combination of factors why people get in trouble. You know, one of those factors is putting money in private, illiquid investments because most of these, even the greatest ones out there, don't work. Okay, so most people, um, when you put money into a private investment, and the same thing with me, I mean, I'll put money in a private investment, and there's only a one in thirty chance it's going to work out the way it's planned. That's what statistics tell us. Sadly, a lot of people are putting their money in nightclubs and car washes and other private, illiquid investments, and they can't get their money out. And, and you don't just lose ten percent when these don't work out; you lose a hundred percent. And and a lot of people don't know what a mutual fund is or a municipal bond or an, a stock or and so on, but they certainly know what a T-shirt company looks like and what a restaurant looks like and so on. And so they end up putting a lot of money there. The uh, overspending is certainly a problem, and our job is to teach them, but not to laugh at them. That's what kills me is how many people want to laugh at these people, and there's no reason for them to know. And I will tell you right here, Dominic, on your radio show, I cannot change a doorknob. And you might think, how can you not change a doorknob? I've never changed a doorknob. I tried doing it once. I couldn't do it. <laughs> but I'm sure that almost everybody can change a doorknob. But I've never learned how to do it. Yeah. Well, they never learned how to write a check. They've never had any money. They don't know what any of these things are. And it's our job to teach and help them. And help them not only because they're good young people, most likely, but they're going to have children. And we can help save generations of wealth and despair by just sharing our knowledge. Is it a mindset as well, Ed? Because we've heard there are some athletes in the past saying, I have mouths to feed, I need to make the money, and, you know, and or maybe they have multiple um, uh, mothers of their children, and there's cars and there's houses. Is it a mindset yeah. that these athletes need to, to, to have, a proper mindset that they need to have to be successful? 
Well, without question. I mean, I didn't know what a baby mama was until I met some guys. <laughs> you, you, I guess you know what a baby mama is, right? I do I now. No. Yeah, I th- I, yeah, it should be mama baby or something. I don't know. But, I mean, I didn't know what this was. But, yeah, a lot of these guys have a lot of kids. And yeah. they, there's a lot of money. And uh, so there's a, do you have to have the proper mindset? Of course. Do you have to understand the dangers if you have multiple children? Yeah, that's a danger financially. Okay, and some of these people, you know, have kids. Some of them don't even know they have the kids. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's no question that it's a mindset that you get. And a lot of people grow up not having that mindset. You know, we, we tend to mirror. Uh, I was talking to some general one day about how we fight battles. And what we do in this country is we mirror their thinking, thinking that they think the same way that we think. And they logically don't think the way that we think. Well, we tend to think that everybody will think very similar to people who grew up in a wealthy neighborhood north of New York City. Well, no. I mean, the, guy, the guys that are growing up in, in very bad neighborhoods in New York and Washington and L.A., they don't think the way I think. And right. we can't continue to think that we can explain things in a way that everybody else would understand. We have to do it in a way that they understand. Do you think the major sports, uh, at least in, in, in our country, are doing enough early enough to, to help combat this, this issue? No. I think uh, you hit right on the point there, Dominic. The, the biggest problem, there's two problems. One of them are agents. So your sports agents show up and they say, I'm going to take care of everything. You don't have to do a thing except get yourself in shape. I'll take care of your training, making sure you're set up and get you a trainer, and everything else I'm going to take care of. Well, here's the secret. Most of these agents don't have any skill set with the exception of a guy like Larry Reynolds in baseball who's ter- terrific. But most have no skill sets, have no knowledge on how any of this works, and they leave these young people out there with you know, relying on them but not really doing anything for them. They might refer them to somebody, but they don't know if those, that person's any good or not because they don't want to be involved with that part of it. These agents say, I'll take care of everything, and they take care of very, very little. Then the leagues themselves have a responsibility to bring in good people and teach. The NFL is far and away the worst. They have a program that is set up by former football players for the most part, and those football players hire other football players, and they that's not a problem, um, but... A lot of them don't have any background in money management, budgeting, and you know family office structures. And that's what really needs to happen is you can't just hire a financial person. You have to hire somebody who can do many different things. And people who do what I do for a living, generally speaking, now I've changed this in my practice, but generally speaking, can't do all the things that are needed in terms of bill paying and overseeing all the documents and things along those lines. So the skill set that's required to do that doesn't come from a, quote, financial person who worked at a Morgan Stanley or a UBS or an independent firm. Those come from family office structures. And that's what's needed, but that's not taught at the NFL. NBA does a much better job than the NFL. They have people who are assigned. They bring in really good, thoughtful people to present. But sadly, the way they're structured is that these people don't speak directly to the players. Those people actually speak to somebody who is called a player development person at each team, and that person then speaks to the players. Hmm. And that was part of the negotiation that took place in the collective bargaining. And then uh, Major League Baseball doesn't have much at all. Um, we're working on that right now. Um, I mentioned uh, that we're doing that, and Tori Hunter and I are working on a program for Major League Baseball. And then the NHL has a psychiatrist that, from the last time I remember, working on a program for them. So the place that people go and you know get their paychecks from or through uh, or associated with really doesn't have anything set up to help educate people and solve this problem. You know, it's interesting. Um, you were you were just talking about money managers. What what would you say are the crucial questions when deciding who a money manager, who you should hire to be your money manager if you're an athlete? Well, I don't really know if there's a crucial one. Um, I 
I don't think there's one question. Uh, it has very little to do with the name of the firm that they're working for um, because most of the problems that athletes run into have little to do with the actual money management. It has more to do with the allocation of their money and how many dollars go into private equity and venture capital and real estate investments and then how many of those people actually sign documents that give somebody power of attorney over their money. Hmm. People don't go broke by investing in the stock market. In, in fact, an interesting point that I point out in all my speeches to athletes is how many 10-year rolling periods did someone lose money in the stock market? So if you're an investor and you invested in 10-year periods, since the history of the market, there's only been two 10-year time periods where anyone lost money. Hmm. That was 1928 to 38 and 29 to 39. So people should have their money in liquid investments. And by the way, they average losing 1% per year. So the idea that you lose money in the market is absolutely a joke. That's just not the case. You lose yeah. money by putting it in venture capital and private equity and real estate. Interesting. Interesting. You're listening to the Championship Showcase, Secrets for Success. From the playing field of competition to the field of life, we are speaking with a very talented Ed Butowski. Ed, what, what advice would you have for somebody, a young athlete coming to your office um, who's maybe just getting started with their career but is saying, listen, I know I need to prepare. What, what are the two or three or four things that you're telling them that they need to be thinking about or doing right now to, to set them up, themselves up for success? Yeah, that, fantastic question. It's, it's real simple. I tell, I tell them the uh, magic around the number 72. If you take the number 72 – and divide it by a rate of return. So let's say 10. That number, 10, is the solution is 7.2, and that is the number of years it'll take to double your money if you grow your money at 10% a year. So a dollar today, if invested and grew at 10%, would be worth $2 in 7.2 years and would be worth $4 in 14.4 years. Hmm. and too many people don't know that. And matter of fact, you might not have known that either. And, and as you think about it, every time that you are able to your money at 10%, or if you were able to do that for a period of time, that $100 that just didn't seem like a lot of money, well, it might be $100 today, but it's really $400 14.4 years from now. Right. And I teach this on and on and on, and I also tell people, the other thing they have to know is that the cost of living increase is far greater than what the government's consumer price index number is. The CPI and the cost of living increase that the government puts out is a bogus number. It has no relevance in the world today, and I don't even know why they do it anymore because it's just not meaningful. What you have to do is figure out what your costs go up every year just to maintain the same standard of living that you have. But most importantly, remember that if you compound that money at 10% and not go for the home run with these private investments, you're going to double your money every 7.2 years, and you will be a wealthy person just to, to make sure that your money is compounding. You will not go broke. You just won't. I think that was the Ben Franklin magic number. Isn't that correct? I, I don't know the Ben Franklin. I've never heard yeah. of that. What is that? Yeah, well, I think that was, I think Ben Franklin, if I remember correctly, kind of came up with that magic number 72, and that's what he, the compounding, compounding number 72, but. Oh. Yeah. So, anyway, there but, you go. See, he did it, because I was going to call it, I was going to call it the Ed Butowski. So thank okay. You. <laughs> hey, listen, does, do you, does, does money play favorites or care what color skin you have or what sport you played? No. I mean, nobody, I, I've actually said this many times, money doesn't know who owns it. And it's going to, because you are a professional athlete or you're a well-known person, because you make an investment in a business doesn't mean that that business is going to magically do well because you're the investor. And you have to learn the same thing somebody else does uh, who's going to be an investor. Uh, I tell people never to invest in any private illiquid investments until they have $3 million after tax put away. Hmm. And once they have that, they should only put 5% of their money 
in any private investments. And that should be broken up into 10 different investments. So therefore, if you have $3 million put away after taxes, you, you should be able to allocate 150000 into private investments, and you should only be able to put, or you should only put about fifteen to um, 30000 per investment because most of them aren't going to work out anyway. Yeah. If you follow that, let your money compound and keep your spending under control, you're not going to have a problem. Great stuff. Great stuff. And just changing the subject a little bit, um, and we appreciate that in- information. I know a lot of people are, gonna, are writing that down right now. Do you think the topic of athletes struggling after their playing careers are over gets enough attention in the, in the general public? Uh, I think it does. Um, I think that people continue to repeat um, a, a number that was made up. Uh, a lot of people don't know that if you ask anybody how many you know, football players go broke, they hear the number, they say 78%. Well, that was a made-up statistic from some NFL meeting back in 2002. There was a reporter from USA Today that asked somebody, from that meeting, give me a number. I need a number. How many players go broke? And he, you know, five years after they finished playing, and this guy said seventy-eight percent. And then someone wrote it, and then someone wrote it again, and someone wrote it again, and it's just not true. Um, it's it, if you take one thing I do know is we have our own uh, calculator on the internet that we don't we don't we just put it up there for free. It's called ChapwoodFDC.com, and it's financial distress calculator. We don't ask anybody's name but we use it for professional athletes. And if you take the top 10% of wage earners out of each sport, about 90% of the players outside of that top 10% of wage earners are in financial distress five years after they finish playing. That I know because we actually do the statistics and have them. Yeah. Um, but does he receive enough uh, in the press? Um, I, I, I think you hear about it a lot, but you don't hear a lot of the solution set, um, you know, talked about. Yeah. But, you know, it'll come up. There's always, you know, you know, almost every couple of weeks you'll hear about somebody else suing their advisor, which, by the way, I also have a problem with. There was a guy uh, named Finney um, who was played for the Balt- – listen to me, I was going to say the Baltimore Colts. You can see how old <laughs> I am now. Played, played for the Indianapolis Colts, uh-huh. and he was suing Bank of America. Well – I got involved with it through through a, a number of different ways, and Bank of America didn't do anything to this person. And you know, it's too often there's a bad advisor out there that you know somebody shines a light on them and says you did a bad job for me. It's not always that way. There's yeah. also something called bad clients, and they have to understand and learn because they put their money at risk. And not every advisor does something wrong. Right, right. Well, you know, as you're talking about in, in advisors and whatnot, Lenny Dykstra's name comes to mind. What were your thoughts around his situation, or, or if you're familiar with it? No. Yeah, he's a moron. I mean, the, the, the guy went out, doesn't have any knowledge about the investment world, started bragging about making money, then, then he goes broke. I mean, he's a guy who definitely has some real issues with who he is and what he thinks he is. Um, but when I said moron, I'll say it again. I mean, anybody who handles himself the way he does and did um, and trying to promote himself as though he was a portfolio manager, um, he was an embarrassment. And I liked him as a ball player, but I don't like him as a, uh, as, as a grown-up advisor about how to handle your personal finances. Uh, guys like him are probably you know, are part of the problem. They encourage people to do things they shouldn't do. Yeah, yeah. Um, a good example. I'll give you another example that you know sometimes caps you know really captures people's attention. But Magic Johnson, I don't know. But yeah. the way Magic Johnson managed his money is completely wrong. You know, you should only have seven to twelve percent of your money in real estate. This guy did a really good job, made a lot of money in real estate. But that's not how you do it. You know, concentration is a great way to get rich, but it's a horrendous way to manage your money. And Magic Johnson managed his money by putting a lot of it in real estate, if not all of it, from what I understand. Hmm. I don't know him. I, I'm sure he has a lot more money than I do, but that's not what you. That's not how you manage your money. You don't emulate people who put a lot of money in one particular investment or one category. It's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because you see Magic Johnson with him on commercials and whatnot. It seems like 
you know, I mean, if you were, if there was a guy out there you'd want to follow, it'd be a guy like him because he's so involved in so many different things with the Dodgers and the Lakers and all that. But what you're saying is yeah. probably not the best way of going, of, of, of managing your money, it sounds like. No, I, I always get really sneaky suspicions about people who are doing a lot of commercials um, because there's, sometimes you look and say, why, why is that person doing that commercial? Well, does that person need the money? And, you know, I don't know Shaq at all. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, but something's odd about how many commercials that guy is in. Just how something many, just doesn't smell right to me. How many products um, he's endorsing? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I call Emmett Smith, who I know, I know Emmett very well. And I see Emmett in, in, the, in Dallas promoting a local sports uh, equipment chain. And I'm thinking, what's going on with Emmett? Um, just just kind of makes you wonder. And, um, and Magic Johnson, great guy, I'm sure. Uh, but if he's out teaching people and people are trying to emulate what he did, it's a really bad idea. People don't need to do what he did with his money. So we're just about out of time, Ed. Knowing what you know now about life and business and athletes and this whole, I mean, obviously you've done a lot of research. You're the guy behind it, the story and, and the documentary. What are the three things? You talked about the Rule of 72, but what are the three most important things an athlete needs to know right now to ensure, just, just summing up our conversation? Doug, you, you don't need the things that, everybody else has. Um, if you spend that money today, whatever you're buying, you know, you probably can't recoup it. Uh, depends on that. So take your time and let your money compound without any question. Do not get married. Um, no, I'm married. So if my <laughs> wife heard that, let me explain. Don't get married at all. No, don't, well, really don't get married. But if you're going to get married, Wait a long time because by the time you're finished playing basketball or baseball or football, <laughs> the way you see the world is going to change. I can't tell you how many ball players I know that act like they are so upset that they have to go back to spring training and they can't wait to do it. And right. then when they're living at home and they're there with their children and their wives, a divorce happens pretty soon after. It's very difficult. So I would encourage anybody to not get married till after they're finished playing. And um, probably the third thing is use your access now because you have access to learn from other people. Use that access today um, to be able to call up people and meet you know, them and sit down with them and learn about their businesses, learn about how things work in the world. Use it now because one day no one's going to remember who you are, what you did, and no one's going to care. But use that access so you can learn today. Nice, nice. Last question, Ed. What do you see your role as a leader, and what is the legacy that you want to leave for others? Uh, teaching them. I, I don't, my players do not go broke, and I teach them, and it's very simple. I started off telling you that I'm not a very smart guy, and I'm not, but I'm a very logical person. And it's not hard to avoid going broke. And uh, probably the nicest thing of all is that Tory Hunter said that his ministry – he wants us to go out and teach people the things that I taught him. The same thing with Wanda, Kevin Durant's mother. I've taught her an awful lot, and she teaches people. And I think getting in there, rolling up my sleeves and teaching people is really what um, I'm most proud of. And I hope that in some small way I'm helping to make some, some young kid's life better. And it really matters to me. It truly does. I, I like being a positive influence on people. Well, it certainly comes through in your voice and in the information you're sharing. Well, everyone, we certainly hope that uh, you have enjoyed our conversation with the incredible Ed Butowski. And I know I have. uh, You've been listening to the Championship Showcase, Secrets for Success from the Playing Field of Competition to the Field of Life. And any last thoughts before we officially sign off today? No. uh, I mean, the only thing I always tell people is just, have amnesia at anything negative in your life and just focus on the positives and you're going to find yourself a lot more successful. Love it. We love it. We want to thank Ed Batosky for joining us and we encourage those of you who feel you might need some assistance through your career transition, please reach out, get the necessary help you need. You have purpose and you have value. Brad Batosky, 
This is Dominic Militello. For now, we want to wish you all the best always, and we'll catch you next time.